Okay, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. We'll give everybody another minute or so to join the Zoom and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I had some technical difficulties on my end. Uh, looks like we've got 71 participants joining us today. So I think that's a, a good number and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Fuller and I'm a member of the DAYL CLE committee. Thank you for joining us for our first CLE presentation of 2022. The CLE committee looks forward to helping you meet your CLE requirements this year with a slate of informative and entertaining presentations. So please be on the lookout for additional opportunities in the future to attend CLEs. And of course, depending on how things go health wise, we are shooting for some of those CLEs to be in person at the Arts District Mansion. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started uh, throughout the presentation today, you'll be able to refer to the CLE number in the chat, which Sherry Harris will post there. So please keep an eye out for the CLE number so you can claim your attendance. And then also uh, we have the Q&A function. So if anyone has any questions, you are more than welcome to submit them through the Q&A function and we will do our best to get to those. Uh, today, I'm joined by an experienced and distinguished panel to talk about litigating injunctive relief in Texas state courts. If that doesn't sound right, you might be in the wrong Zoom meeting. Um, so I hope everyone's in the right place. And with that, let's get started. We're joined today first by Judge Monica, Judge Monica Purdy. She's the presiding judge of the 95th Judicial District Court in Dallas County. Before getting elected there, she served as an associate judge to the state civil district courts uh, unanimously appointed by the then 13 presiding judges in 2013. And in her role as an associate judge, Judge Purdy supported several state civil district courts in conducting a wide range of judicial tasks, including jury and bench trials, presiding over motion hearings, injunctions, important for us, temporary restraining orders, and discovery disputes. So Judge Purdy, thank you so much for joining us today. We also have Marcus Fettinger here. He is a partner in Gray Reed's Dallas office. He primarily represents employment side clients. He frequently finds himself in court litigating for or against injunctive relief in cases involving trade secret theft, solicitation of customers or employees in violation of non-disclosure, non-competition and non-solicitation agreements. Ryan Bowerly is a partner in Gorenson, Bain, Osley's Plano and Dallas offices. He is a board certified attorney in family law. His clients include professionals, executives, doctors, attorneys, and their spouses. He brings extensive experience and sincere compassion to situations involving contested custody, special needs, mental health issues, and substance abuse. And last but not least, we have Nicole Munoz Hushka, she is an associate with Figari Davenport and her practice primarily focuses on business, commercial insurance and employment litigation. Um, a few months ago, what got me interested in putting the CLE together was my firm's clients. We represent school districts all across the state and they were facing a seemingly endless barrage of applications for injunctive relief filed by parent groups and later the Texas Attorney General. 
And without any experience litigating requests for injunctive relief myself, I felt like I was drinking from a fire hose. So in coming up with the idea for this CLE, my hope was to invite some distinguished and experienced panelists to talk about the nuts and bolts of the high stakes, fast paced world of injunctive relief. Uh, the objective here today is to give the 30,000 foot view of seeking and defending against applications or temporary restraining orders in state court. Whether you're seeking or defending against a temporary restraining order, the clock is ticking and the pressure is on and making quick informed decisions may mean all the difference. We'll talk about when to seek injunctive relief, the Texas Civil Rules of Texas Rules of Civil Procedure and Dallas County local rules that govern injunctive relief, practical considerations for preparing for a temporary injunction hearing, and finally, how an opposing party can seek to dissolve or modify a temporary injunction. So to get us started, deciding when to request injunctive relief. Marcus, what kind of situations or contexts are appropriate for a client to seek a temporary restraining order? Thanks, Josh. So the Texas courts define a TRO as an extraordinary remedy. Um, in my opinion, TROs are overused. I had a judge tell me once that if you're not about to chop down an old tree or tear down an old mansion, come back tomorrow. Uh, in the employment context, you know, we see a lot of TROs and the trade secret. Once the toothpaste is out of the tube, can't put it back in. Um, in restrictive covenant situations, you know, you need to have immediate and irreparable harm. If you don't have those things, you shouldn't be going to get a TRO. And I can tell you, I'm sure Judge Purdy would agree with me, courts do not take kindly to you disrupting their docket, seeking a TRO when you don't have a true emergency. Great. Thank you. And like I just introduced everybody, we have experienced lawyers joining us today who practice employment law, family law, commercial and business law, and insurance law. So Judge Purdy, I'll ask you, in your estimation from the bench, from what field or industry do you most often see litigants seeking injunctive relief? I think that uh, Marcus covered those areas. Uh, primarily, we see them in the employment context, covenants not to compete. Someone is going to work for a competitor. Uh, maybe they're in sales. Maybe they are contacting clients and taking them with them, uh, poaching, that kind of thing. Uh, business disputes, um, typically breakups between partnerships, almost like uh, they're getting ready to get into some type of business divorce. They've been taken off of the certificate of formation. They've been locked out of bank accounts, uh, things of that nature. And uh, what we are seeing much more here in state court are sort of your trade secrets, confidential information. Um, that is where we are seeing probably the most of the TROs and TIs. Great, thank you so much. Um, Nicole, what is the purpose of a TRO? Sure, a TRO is usually something added in my line of work when we're filing a civil lawsuit. Sometimes we will file a TRO and I agree with Marcus and that they are very much overused these days. But the purpose of a TRO is when there is a status quo that you are trying to preserve. And the status quo, and I've had several hearings where we argue what that is, it's the last moment where all reasonable parties agreed was the last moment of peace between them before the underlying controversy arose. Um, the status quo is not what your client wishes had happened before the lawsuit was filed. And I've had to counsel clients again on that and also defend on that. Great, yeah, in our school district mass litigation, the defining the status quo was definitely uh, an important moment uh, you had the governor issuing executive orders. You had school districts responding by implementing their own local mask mandates. So everybody kind of was disagreeing, I would say, about when was the last actual peaceable non-contested status. Um, Ryan, in family law, what types of circumstances do you see TROs being filed? Or sure. and thanks again, Josh, so much for having me on the panel. And I'm going to agree with everybody else speaking here that Marcus hit the nail on the head in several different instances. Um, the grounds are essentially the same, that there needs to be irreparable loss, injury, or damage that will result before notice can be formally served on the other side and a hearing can, can be held. 
But what it really means, at least in the family law context, is there's a true emergency. And basically in the family law realm, there's basically, you've got protective orders and you've got restraining orders. And there's a lot of interlocutory or things that overlap, but you know, the protective order is the most extreme remedy we have. Those are for family violence situations. There are criminal implications associated with that. Family law, uh, TROs, I mean, somebody needs to be prevented from seeing their spouse, their, their child, usually due to some sort of severe drug or alcohol abuse. Maybe somebody has a severe mental health disorder that is untreated or they're in some sort of psychosis where they're a danger to themselves, their spouse, significant other, or their children. Just last week, I filed one where uh, a spouse said she was going in for a routine doctor's appointment or what we thought was a routine doctor's appointment. And then she had been in a institution after a suicide attempt. And eventually this all came out. Uh, we filed a TRO just to kind of keep the kids away from mom, just until we can at least get to a hearing. And ultimately we resolved the issue by agreement, but the goal was to pre present or make sure the kids are protected. I also agree with my esteemed colleagues that these are highly overused. There are standing orders, at least in the family law context, that offer a bunch of really good injunctions for stuff you can't do while a case is pending. I think it really is a sore spot for practitioners and judges when people file TROs and request the same type of stuff that's already covered in a standing order. Great. Um, moving a little bit ahead in my outline that I prepared for everybody. Um, so Marcus, as we just talked about, you need a threat of imminent harm that's likely going to result in irreparable injury to your client. Can you talk about that a little bit more in connection with um, being compensated with damages? Yeah, so for a TRO, I can't go in to Judge Purdy and say, Judge, I, I need a TRO for something that I can get damages in in a lawsuit. So if I can quantify the damages, like if they do this, I will be harmed in this way. I don't have to be able to quantify them at the time, but if they can be quantified through discovery, then a TRO is not an appropriate remedy. Things that, that I see in the employment field of what we call irreparable harm is it, usually trade secrets and confidential information. If I have a customer list and it's my customer list and I don't want my competitors to have it, if someone is about to send that out in the public domain, it loses all of its value. Now, what it's worth, I don't know. How we're damaged from that, I don't know. But that's the point of a TRO is, you know, I said this earlier and I'll say it again. I think it's, a judge said this to me one time, if you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, then a TRO is probably an appropriate remedy. That's a great saying, I love that. Uh, moving on ahead to the Texas rules of civil procedure that govern TROs and temporary injunctions. Um, Nicole, you just very eloquently explained what the purpose of a TRO is, and that's to preserve the status quo. Under the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, how long can a TRO preserve the status quo? Sure. Typically, it's 14 days unless uh, you can get an extension um, from opposing counsel and, and get a court to sign an extension order. And it's Ryan, really that, that 14 days is really usually to bridge the gap between your TRO and your temporary injunction hearing. Okay, Ryan, if we're talking about an extension of a TRO, how can a party seek that? So the most common occurrence in my line of work is just by agreement. Uh, specifically, usually an attorney is hired last minute on the case that in, in family law generally, the temporary order is happens the same time as a TRO, happens the same time as a temporary injunction. So if you're hired 48 hours beforehand, you probably need your enough time to get up to speed on the case. So that's what we see most often. And of course, I'm showing upon good cause, the court has the authority to extend the TRO as well for 14 days. Okay, and Marcus, if you're going to seek or request an extension of a TRO, how do you have to notify the court? Uh, generally, it's either a joint motion to extend or unopposed motion to extend. The court can extend the TRO for a 14 day period absent agreement of the parties. But beyond that, everything has to be either agreed or unopposed. Uh, you need to file a motion or if you do do it in court, you need a orally, you need a written order from the court extending the TRO because you can't extend a TRO orally. 
Brian, going back to you, can you talk about the difference between seeking a TRO with or without notice to the adverse party and what considerations should be top of mind in deciding to provide or not provide notice to an adverse party? Sure. Uh, generally, you got to follow your local rules regarding notice. And I think it's Dallas County Local Rule 2.01 and 02. Uh, and make sure you look at the ones that's specific to your practice because there are different ones. Uh, for me, uh, it's whether or not there's a lawyer on the other side. I personally think you should always notify the other side, especially in this day and age where lots of when, when you present the TRO to the court, the judge can zoom you in. You don't have to race down to the courthouse like we used to. I think a judge would be annoyed if I showed up in the courtroom without at least placing a phone call or an email to the other lawyer, if nothing else but for a professional courtesy. Um, there is the exception that can apply if there's just no time or imminent harm or situation that would be made more dangerous by letting the other side know. Um, but I have yet to really encounter that. Um, if Generally, if there's a lawyer on the other side in the family law context, you got to let them know. If they're pro se, then oftentimes we don't. Okay, and I'm going to go a little bit off script here with a question that we got in. Sometimes non-competes and other agreements state that the parties agree that a violation will constitute irreparable harm supporting injunctive relief. I think this is most appropriately directed to Judge Purdy. So Judge Purdy, what effect, if any, does the party's agreement like that have on a court's willingness to grant a TRO or TI? I think a lot of times you just have to look obviously at the four corners of the document that is before you, obviously. Um, you know, certainly when there are a lot of employment cases or covenants not to compete, uh, we all know that the courts have the power uh, to maybe limit sort of geographical determination, um, the time period that an employer is not supposed to uh, uh, compete with his uh, former employer, that type of thing. So I think it really just depends. Um, I want to make sure that I'm not giving any type of advisory opinion as to what I would do in my particular court uh, if that issue were presented. Uh, but I mean, I definitely would pay attention to the language that they agreed to. Uh, but it's going to depend on the circumstances and everything that goes along with that particular case. Great. Thank you so much. Nicole, if no notice is provided, the Texas rules of civil procedure are clear on what a temporary restraining order must include. So what are some of the key components of an enforceable TRO? Sure. And this is important because most of us draft a proposed TRO order with our application for TRO. So this is really good for your average practitioner to keep in mind when you're drafting your own order. So um, it's got to be endorsed with the date and hour of issuance. I usually leave blanks for those for the, for the court to fill in. Um, it's got to be filed at the clerk's office and entered on the record before you can make it enforceable. Um, and it's got to, this is where people get into the weeds. It's got to define the injury and explain exactly what the other party is being restrained from doing. Um, that's, that's an area where if I'm defending, I'll usually attack. Um, and then it's also got to expire. It's got to explain when it expires by because the, the enjoined party needs to know everything it can to reasonably comply with that. So that's just fair. But again, that, that third one where it's got to clearly define the injury statewide, you know, irreparable and, you know, why the order was given with no notice. And I don't know if I touched on that before. It's got to include those things to give fair notice to the other side. And again, and this is with all orders, it's got to def clearly define what the other side is being enjoined from doing. Right, and that's, we find that in rule 683, it talks about the language being specific in its terms and describing in reasonable detail the act or act sought to be restrained. So Marcus, when it comes to drafting a proposed order for the judge to sign, what practice tips would you, would you offer for young lawyers? So I will tell you, I, when I'm defending a against a TRO, I think that this is the area I see the most problems. One of the most common drafting errors I see is including findings on the merits. That is not appropriate at the injunctive relief stage. All you have to show is a likelihood of success on the merits, which candidly is not a very high bar. You just have to present some evidence that you could prevail. Um, oftentimes practitioners that don't necessarily handle injunctions on a regular basis will overreach. And I, I can tell you that very little has 
in my experience, has angered judges more than an overreaching TRO. Again, like everyone's been saying, the idea is to maintain the status quo. You don't get to you don't get to win your case at the TRO stage. You don't get ultimate relief. You get narrow injunctive relief. Occasionally, it can be mandatory if it's give us our stuff back. But I don't like to put that stuff in. I like it to be prohibitive. Uh, don't touch it. Don't use it. And then you can work out a protocol to get your stuff back or handle that at the TI hearing. Um, again, the like Nicole touched on, the act sought to be restrained. I see people doing a very poor job of defining that and trying to involve non-parties. They're like, this person, their officers, their agents, their employees. It's like, well, unless they have notice of this TRO, they can't be restrained. And courts are going to be reluctant to restrain non-parties to a litigation from doing something when they haven't even had an opportunity to defend themselves. Excellent, I think that's great advice. So if you're out there, you're drafting the proposed order, draft it narrowly because know that somebody on the other side is gonna be ready to attack the language that you are drafting it and, and look to make it even narrower. Um, I'll go back to Nicole. Let's talk about rule 681. We, we mentioned that uh, you, you don't necessarily need to give notice to the other side about a temporary restraining order before it issues. Um, that's not exactly the same with the temporary injunction. So how does a temporary injunction and the issue of notice differ from a TRO? Sure, so a temporary injunction, you know, typically lasts a lot longer than a TRO. The whole point is for the temporary injunction to be in place until a trial of, on the merits. And as many of you know, sometimes that can take a couple of years, especially um, in this age. Um, so correct, you don't have to give notice for a TRO, you can do an ex parte TRO, but for a temporary injunction, you have to give notice. It's in the statute. Um, it does say that, you know, reasonable notice is required, um, an opportunity for the other side to be reasonably heard. It doesn't explain how many days. Um, and I had a fun case last month where the other side gave our in-house counsel 48 hours notice of a temporary injunction uh, hearing. And that didn't fly. I, I think a lot of people look at the local rules, but go back to the to the regular rules. I believe it's Texas Rule 21 um, requires three days notice for any hearing. Um, now it excludes obviously motions for summary judgment, but you know at the very least three days notice is required under the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Now if you if you do um, if you do take a deeper dive into 681 and look at what courts have said on a reasonable opportunity to be heard means. Um, there are cases that say you've got to give the other side noti enough notice to where they can merely do more than just cross-examine the movement's witnesses. They can get their own evidence. They can get their own witnesses. And that simply can't be done within a couple of days. And most, most courts are don't look kindly when the movement only gives the required three days notice when they filed the lawsuit last month, got the TRO, you know, ex parte two weeks ago and just now served you. So um, remember that 681, while doesn't have a total number of days, um, it does allow the, um, the non-movement a reasonable opportunity to be heard. And like I said, most cases say that means enough time to get their own uh, witnesses and evidence together, not just merely to cross-examine whoever the movement brought. Um, so that, that's my practical tip. And um, oh, I've had some issues where the other side goes, oh, well, I didn't know who to serve. And I'm like, yeah, you did, because you've been talking to our in-house counsel for the past three months. So those are always fun. Josh, can I pop in real quick? Go ahead. I know we keep saying that the TRO can be issued without notice, and, and that is true. But I will tell you, in the employment context, if you don't at least notify the former employee that you sued them and that you're going down there to seek, seek a TRO, tell them where the courthouse is. I mean, generally when you're suing somebody, they probably have never been sued before, if, especially in the trade secret arena. Uh, they don't, you know, they took this stuff and they're probably like, ha ha, I got this and now it's mine. Well, I know in my experience, when I go down there, I text the person, I email the person and I call the person. And I think it's really good as a practical pointer to file an affidavit if you're the attorney and say, I sent this, I sent this, I sent this. So that when you get there, the judge doesn't say, well, did you at least let him know? It's like, well, judge, not only did I let him know, I've, I've verified as an officer of the court that I've given them notice and an opportunity to be heard. I was just going to add something on that as well. Um, 
in terms of the notice issue, I can tell you, especially coming into the elected seat as a judge, being the associate judge, here in our civil district courts, a lot of the TROs are heard by the associate judges. And so uh, ex parte, even though those things happen where we do have to issue a TRO based on an ex parte basis, no one really likes to do that. <laughs> they like for everyone to kind of be notified of what's happening in court. Um, again, as I mentioned, there might be some reasons where they can't be notified. Uh, maybe if I notify them, they're going to drain the bank account, that type of thing. Um, but uh, I much prefer notice on the other side, especially if I'm going to be signing an order. But the court does understand there are some instances in which notice cannot be given to the other side. The other thing that I want to say about notice is that the uh, local rules, that's the minimum notice that you have to provide the other side. Um, that's not necessarily best practices, but that's the minimum notice that has to be provided. And I personally don't think it's sufficient to say, I am going down to the courthouse and, get a, and getting a TRO uh, in sort of this hide and seek game, find me if you can. Um, I want you to go through that different step as a practitioner to say, okay, we just filed, it landed in Judge Purdy's court. She's gonna be in the 95th District Court. Here's the Zoom information, it's contained on her website, or this is the physical location of her court. Because I can tell you as the associate judge, just that whole notion of walking a TRO and figuring out which court you can get to, uh, we really don't like to have to do that if, if we can guard against doing it. So that's the only thing that I wanted to add to that particular discussion. That's fantastic. And I think some really practical tips, you know, as a courtesy to the to the adverse party. Um, don't just say meet me at the courthouse, find me at the courthouse, but, but be a little bit more specific and give as much notice, you know, more than you probably think you should. Um, Ryan, I want to jump back into the rules of civil procedure here with rule 682, which requires that a request for temporary injunction be verified. What does that mean? That just means a sworn statement. So with an affidavit or a, I guess in some circumstances you can do an unsworn declaration, but I generally don't recommend that. Um, but in the family law context, I would add that it, there is a difference whether you're doing it ex parte or not, because if you go down to the courthouse, ask for a TRO, somebody's enjoined from seeing their children, talking to them, consuming alcohol, whatever, that's one avenue. Another avenue is these temporary order hearings. We have them in many divorce and modification and custody cases where maybe your hearings in a month and those types of things don't need to be necessarily verified because if you're asking for exclusive use of a residence, exclusive use of a vehicle for the other side to not do something, to not disparage the, uh, the other parent in front of the child, those things you don't need to verify. Those you just need to request and give just a standard notice pleading to. Okay, thank you very much. And rule 684 talks about a bond amount. Marcus, can you tell us about the bond requirement found in rule 684? Yeah, so I mean, for those that don't know, a bond is required for any temporary restraining order or temporary injunction. Something that drives me absolutely crazy is when someone goes to court and they say, well, judge, this contract says that a temporary restraining order can issue without the necessity of a bond. And a judge told opposing counsel one time, that's great. And uh, unfortunately, you're not in the Texas House of Representatives, Texas legislature, so you don't get to change the law today. Uh, it is a temporary restraining order is void without a bond. And the purpose of the bond, you know, a lot of times I will go down and the employee won't show up. So if I'm putting someone out of work and taking away their salary, the bond is their protection. So in non-compete cases, you're gonna see much higher bonds, right? If they're making $1,000 a week and you're putting them out of work for two weeks, well, the bond should be $2,000 at least because that's the only protection they have if the injunction was issued wrongfully or obtained wrongfully. For a trade secret case and you say, you can't send our trade secrets anywhere, well, you're not really, and joining them from doing anything they're not legally supposed to do. So, you know, you can see a much smaller bond in those cases. And then just as a practical matter, if you're going down to seek 
a TRO, if you want to make the judge really mad, come up with a ridiculously low number for your bond, and then they're going to throw it right back at you. That's been my experience. If you go down and you say, judge, I calculated the bond because this person makes $5,000 a week, and I'm asking you to put them out of work for two weeks, so I think the bond should be $10,000, and you have a basis for your bond amount, you're going to have so much more credibility with the judge. Maybe say, well, put them out of work for two weeks and just make the bond $500. Well, that's not going to protect them if something improper has occurred in either your affidavit, your facts are wrong, the TRO gets dissolved, things like that. I was going to jump in here as well. Sure. And I think uh, Marcus is, is uh, again, uh, right on the money in this particular one because uh, I call it, I like to categorize the argument is, we have all these damages, $3.5 million in damages, but I want a bond of $100. Um, how does that work? But I, I hear that all the time, well thought out argument. But when they get to the bond part, no one has really given a lot of thought as to the bond. Um, I remind them that the statute basically provides guidance for setting a bond and the court is going to be guided by what the statute says. And essentially what it says is the bond is to be set based upon damages that the defendant may suffer over the next 14 days should the TRO not have issued for whatever reason. Um, so there has to be some damages that this defendant uh, could, could likely encounter uh, over those next 14 days. Uh, so I, I tell you, I see that often. Um, Essentially, we have a lot of uh, TROs where homeowners come in um, and it's foreclosure Tuesday, every first Tuesday on the courthouse steps here. And they want to file a TRO because they didn't get notice of their foreclosure, which very well may be the case, uh, but they have to give me some type of guidance as to a bond to set if I decide to issue that TRO. Um, typically, it's a lot of pro se parties, so uh, typically they're not well versed in that particular area, but I'm going to be asking questions like, what is your mortgage payment? Are you currently behind on that? Uh, because if this gets pulled from that sale, this borrower is missing those particular funds. So I have to have some basis in which to do that, uh, but I did want to add that I think a lot of people don't think about the bond as much as they think about the argument. Um, and so it kind of is a whole credibility issue for me when I hear that I have like $5 million in damages, but I want $100 as my bond. Um, it's kind of like, uh, what? Yeah, like, you know, that doesn't work. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Great. And I think that was a perfect segue into my next question, which was, in, if a party is seeking or defending against injunctive relief, Judge Purdy, what kind of judicial pet peeves do you have um, when it comes to that? I think you just talked about not giving enough thought to the bond amount. What else do you see that that kind of uh, goes against some of the great advice that we've that we've heard here so far today? Well, yeah, I, I will just tell you, um, obviously, I was the associate judge in our civil district courts for the past seven and a half years before sitting in the particular court that I'm at that I'm in currently. Um, so I think I have a lot of experience with TROs and, and temporary injunction hearings. And we talked about, you know, obviously extending TROs, uh, getting an extension. Um, so essentially what's kind of a pet peeve for me is that the TRO continues to get, well, there's an argument. There's an argument that we got to have this TRO judge. This, this is going on right now. If you don't, you know, give us this TRO, pretty much the sky is falling. You know, we're, we're never going to be able to get this back. But then when I look at the docket, it just keeps getting extended, extended with no date in sight as to when we might get to this TI hearing that I understood you needed it right then, right now, clear up the docket, I got to go. Uh, so when I see it keep getting extended, I, I'm almost of the opinion that maybe you didn't really need it in the beginning, that maybe you probably just should have been talking or it could have been maybe even worked out in a rule 11 type of agreement. Um, so that is kind of a pet peeve um, because obviously there's some argument about the um, immediate harm that is impending. 
Um, but if something keeps getting extended, I guess that that's sort of a pet peeve for me. We talked about the notice issue, um, not giving someone notice. Um, for instance, I have parties that have been in litigation for years and they will find the need to file a TRO. Um, obviously that's a different situation than someone has just hired you and you are looking at the facts of your case and you decide the strategy is for us to go to the courthouse and seek a TRO. Uh, but it's just when the lawyers sort of start this gamemanship where we're gonna get a TRO. Um, and you know, then I have someone coming down to the courthouse, we didn't get notice. Uh, well, we didn't know we were representing who, who you represented on this. Like we've been representing them in the underlying litigation for the past two years. We talked to you that Friday when you went down to the courthouse and got the TRO. Um, so that is a real big pet peeve uh, that the court would have. Um, family law is a little bit different than uh, the civil district courts that we have here. Uh, we know that in the family law district courts, each of them have their own associate judge. Well, there's two associate judges in the civil district courts, and they sort of field the work for all of the 13 district courts. So it's a little bit different in that regard. In that regard. Um, again, we talked about maintaining the status quo, trying to figure out what was that sort of uncontested, peaceable event before you if actually issued the TRO. But I guess the pet peeve that I would have with that would be someone who wants every they, they want everything all of the relief in the tro we don't even get to trial just give me everything right here and that that's not what the statute was designed for uh basically in the ti hearing trying to think that that's your trial time um having people to tell me it's going to be six hours no that i mean in the court's dockets that we have now that's just this is not possible so probably not estimating your time accurately and the bond amount. I think those are some of sort of the biggest pet peeves that uh, courts might have when dealing with TROs and temporary injunctions. Fantastic. I hope everybody out there was taking good notes. Um, like I think Ryan mentioned, the local rules in Dallas County, the local rules are always a great place for a, a lawyer to look when you're facing procedural questions that you can't seem to find the answer to. And in Dallas County, we have rule 2.02 about applying for TROs and other ex parte orders. Um, so it's important to note, of course, that on top of the requirements from the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure that we just talked about, you also need to consult, at least if you're litigating in Dallas County, the local rules of the court, um, which requires two hours notice, um, but there's an exception to that when, of course, you're facing imminent harm an irreparable injury that that kind of notice just can't be provided. Um, Marcus, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in our outline. Um, when when do you certify those kinds of situations, and, and how do you do that with the court? So, are you asking me when I certify that that it wouldn't be possible to give notice? Correct. I mean, in situations like that, first of all, they're extremely rare. I, I've handled tons of TRO matters, and I think I've done that one time. And the situation was was pretty extraordinary. And it was an employee got fired, sent a text message to his boss and said, I'm going to publish the blueprints for this product that we designed on my personal website. Well, obviously, if I called him and said, hey, I'm going to court, uh, he's going to publish the, the, the blueprints before I can get the order. So that I mean, that was the only time I've ever done that. Generally, if you're worried about trade secrets or, or breaching a, a non-solicit or non-compete, if you give somebody notice, they're going to be terrified. Um, and I think that's something that practitioners lose sight of. If I get a, if I'm, you know, a, a salesman of software and I get a notice that I've been sued and that they're seeking this order from the court against me, I'm probably not going to do whatever bad stuff I was doing before. If you have like someone that's really malicious and is already threatening to do these really bad things, in that case, the courts are a little bit more receptive to the argument that you didn't need to give notice. But another thing about notice, and I, I think everyone will agree with me on this one, is that the two hours, that's great and everything, but if you file the lawsuit on Monday and then you wait until Wednesday to go get your TRO and you notify them Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. and then you're in the court at 10 a.m., like I gave them the two hours, like 
why didn't you just tell him on Monday when you filed the lawsuit? Because if it was that important, you would have come down here on Monday. So that goes back to the credibility argument. And I think TROs hinge on the applicant, applicant's counsel's credibility. Because if the judge doesn't believe what you're selling, there's no way that she's going to issue uh, extraordinary remedy of a TRO. So the more things you can do to look like the knight in shining armor and that you're really trying to play by the rules, the more credibility you get and the more likely you are to succeed, assuming that you can meet your elements. And Nicole, in the, I guess, unlikely scenario that you might seek an ex parte order without providing notice to the other side, what Texas disciplinary rule of professional conduct does this implicate? Um, that is a good question. I believe it's 303, um, which is essentially just the rule that like you can't lie to the court. I mean, it's a whole paragraph, but that's if I was going to summarize it, you can't misrepresent things and you can't lie to the court. And I've got an example where um, hopefully we're going to trial in three months um, over a case involving a very um, special um, non-monetary asset that my client built. Um, and we tried to get a TRO um, and we, uh, gosh, it's been a couple of years since this has been pending, but you know, it, it's not, we're not talking about money, although we are, but at the time we're talking about an asset, a piece of equipment that my client built. It's very unique that the other side threatened on social media and to my client that they were going to go sell at an auction, you know, later on that day. So, I mean, it didn't make sense um, for us to, to wait. We had to go file a TRO and then their lawyer completely said, oh, don't worry, we're not going to sell this. Um, don't worry, judge, clients are completely trustworthy um, and said some things that really weren't true um, and found out a couple months later, and which is one of the reasons we're still in litigation. So, you know, you can't lie to the court when you're, um, I know we all, we can't always control our clients and that's the understatement of a lifetime, but um, you know, you can't knowingly make false statements of law or fact to the court. Well, let's move forward to talking about temporary injunctions. A temporary injunction is an equitable remedy and it goes hand in hand with seeking a temporary restraining order. So Ryan, I'll pose the question to you. What must a litigant prove to obtain temporary relief from a court? So if it's based on a TRO, it's that same basis that we talked about earlier today, just the uh, probable imminent irreparable injury or harm to a, essentially a, a kiddo, a party, or a piece of property. Um, but when it comes to the actual hearing itself, really what the court will just look at is the safety and welfare of the child and is necessary and equitable to preserve property. And, you know, property and TOs go hand in hand. So if somebody has exclusive use of the house, of course, the other side is enjoined from entering upon or using that house. Same thing with the cars. Um, really quickly, because we were taking the opportunity to give our pet peeves about TROs, I thought of a couple. So I'd like to share those really quickly. Go uh, for it. Do not file a TRO as an excuse to get a hearing sooner. That is ridiculous. I've had many cases where we're three weeks out from a hearing and the other lawyer or their client just cannot wait. And they just make up some really shady affidavit and they make me waste everybody's time and everybody's money and they always lose. And guess who the judge is mad at when we get there? It's not my client, it's them. And I've noticed it's the same attorneys again and again and again. And I assume the judges reach the same conclusions that I do, but I know sometimes when I draw an attorney on the other, the other side, I'm like, I bet you that guy's gonna file a TRO for no reason in this case. And it's really unfortunate that that has to happen. Um, and I've had people use it as a litigation tactic. If you don't agree to this mediation date or send me a settlement offer, I'm going to go get a restraining order. Are you kidding me? That's absolutely ridiculous. It violates the professional rules that we've been talking about. Uh, you know, and the big picture is that there needs to be an emergency if you're asking for a TRO. There needs to be grounds for it if you're asking for a TRO. Don't use it as a tactic, and I promise you, it'll blow up in your face as the practitioner, and it'll blow up in your client's face later on. Stepping off my soapbox now. Thank you. No, go ahead. I mean... All input is welcome. Um, so you just mentioned that one of the elements of seeking injunctive relief is a probable right to the relief sought. Nicole, what does that say about the burden of proof uh, at a temporary injunction hearing? Sure. Well, the movement's got to be able to, it's not, 
the movement doesn't have to prove all their elements like they do at trial, but they've got to put on enough evidence to show that they could be entitled to this relief. And one of the easiest things is when, you know, the movement's causes of action, they're not even the right party to assert that kind of claim. Um, so it's those types of things that the, the movement's got to jump over to establish probable um, right to relief. And again, focusing on the word probable, Marcus, does that mean that an applicant for temporary injunction has to 100% dispositively show that he's going to prevail at trial? No, I mean, it, this isn't a trial. This isn't preponderance of the evidence. This isn't summary judgment. Uh, it's you got to give the court enough meat that they could make the logical jump that one day you will be able to make your ultimate case. I mean, there, there's case law that just says, basically more likely than not that you, that you could prevail in the future as opposed to deciding if you can prevail right now. And I think that goes back to what Judge Purdy said is you're not at the TRO or TI stage to get ultimate relief. You're there to maintain the status quo. And when people try to get ultimate relief, it's just not appropriate because you can't make those findings in a one hour TI hearing. You, you didn't have the chance to try your case. And Josh, I, I was going to add uh, that typically I know uh, what I like to do is I typically look at that application for a TRO. I'm going to hone in on the causes of action that you are pled, that, that have been pled, uh, take a look at the uh, verification on the application for the TRO, and I am required to determine whether or not you have met the burden of a probable right of relief to recovery on those causes of action. So I'm going to be tracking that as you offer your argument and looking for that uh, in that particular affidavit. So I want to make sure that uh, individuals understand that it's a probable right of relief. I don't have to determine whether or not you, you will win. I have to just determine whether or not you have a probable right of relief to recovery. Um, and so I wanted to just offer that. And then I also wanted to add uh, something to what Ryan said. I was sort of thinking there were like two other additional pet peeves out there before we move into the temporary injunction phase. And as the associate judge, filing your TRO on the eve of a holiday. So literally it's July 3rd at 4.15 and you have a TRO the day before July 4th. Um, that's normally a red flag for me. I didn't figure that out my first year. Uh, uh, that I was the associate judge, but I figured it out pretty quickly afterwards. So I think there are individuals that will literally call down and figure out who is at the courthouse at 415 on July 3rd, if it falls on a Friday. And if they figure out nobody is down there except for the associate judge, they will run and file that TRO. Uh, so that's, that's a pet peeve. Now you might have a basis to do that, but a lot of times that they are meritless. Uh, when they do that. And I think the other thing that Ryan had indicated is indicating you have an emergency when it's really not an emergency. Um, you know, we, we take emergencies very seriously, move heaven and earth to try to make sure that you get before a judge uh, to have the emergency heard. And then when it's determined it's really not an emergency, uh, that, that's a pet peeve. Fantastic. Thank you for adding that in there. Keep, keep piling on the pet peeves, it helps us. <laughs> um, so moving on from kind of pleading for injunctive relief, you're now in front of a court and you've got to be an advocate for showing that there is that imminent and irreparable harm where the only question before the judge is whether the applicant is entitled to an order to preserve the status quo pending trial on the merits. Um, judge Purdy, let's say hypothetically a party requesting a temporary injunction once a jury for the hearing. And we've talked about how a TI hearing is not a trial on the merits. Can a party choose whether he or she wants a jury to hear the application for a TI? No, they may not. So brief answer to that question. Um, it's not a jury trial. Uh, the TRO is uh, basically based upon the pleadings. That's why they are verified. Uh, it's not an evidentiary proceeding. The temporary injunction is an evidentiary proceeding, but it will be tried before a judge. Uh, so there is no uh, right to a jury trial when you're in a temporary injunction hearing. 
And Marcus, one of the key items a lawyer will need to address is preparing witnesses. If a witness is unavailable because of time constraints or travel issues, can a lawyer rely on a witness's affidavit? And what is your preference in submitting affidavits? You, you can submit an affidavit, but because it's not scrutinized by cross-examination, the weight of an affidavit given by a judge may vary. Um, I will tell you in, in this what I call third year of COVID. Uh, if you can't get someone on the phone or on video and you think that you need to try to get an affidavit in the record, there's going to be so many questions about the credibility of that witness. You may as well not have filed anything. Um, I, I just, I, I haven't seen an affidavit where I'm like, okay, that was absolutely necessary to make your case. And now I don't get to cross-examine your witness, but we're just going to take everything they said is true. You know, the court, the court may take it into consideration, and I'm not going to speak for any judges, but I will tell you, in my mind, I think that an affidavit is minimal evidence of anything at all if, if they're not subject to cross. I think that was a perfect transition to ask Judge Purdy as a practical matter in your court. How do you feel about parties offering uh, affidavits as opposed to live witness testimony and how has that practice changed or not changed due to COVID-19? Well, I think the practice has changed quite a bit. We all know with Zoom, it's much more flexible. Um, you, you don't really have the uh, same type of, uh, I won't call them excuses, but you don't have the same response. You know, the person is unavailable. They live in China. Uh, they're this place. I can't get them here. Everybody can get on Zoom. If, if they have an internet, they can do that. So it's made it more, it's made it easier to appear and more flexible in which to appear. Um, I can tell you that most judges are not going to, most judges recall what it is like to have been a practitioner. Um, and so if you're gonna present an affidavit and then I have the other side say, Your Honor, we have no way in which to cross-examine this person. I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing it like you're seeing it. I, I, don't, I don't have any way to cross-examine them, ask them what they meant by this. I don't know what context, then that's gonna be problematic for the person presenting that particular affidavit. Um, and I think, you know, what we've talked about, one of the things here, Joss, the basis for this all goes back to sort of notice and being put on notice of not only what you're trying to litigate, but what you're trying to defend. And if we all can remember, like due process is something very serious that courts take. Uh, so if you're going to have an affidavit out there, there better be, be a means in which the other side can cross-examine. Okay, thank you very much, Judge. And uh, I see we're running out of time almost here. I wanna get to our last topic, which is dissolving or modifying injunctions. Um, real quickly, Ryan, can you tell us why would, why would a party ever want to dissolve or modify a, an injunction and what's the basis for doing so? So if it's a TRO, maybe it's just in place pending hearing. Somebody does something they're not supposed to, it's faulty. Maybe it was done by a pro se litigant, your client lawyers up, you file a motion to dissolve it even before you get to the courthouse. Um, sometimes it's just not needed anymore. And then you're looking at modifying what the injunction is. Maybe there was a step up possession plan for a, a parent who had some sort of substance abuse problem or places they weren't allowed to go and they're doing what they're supposed to do. And some of those restrictions need to come away. So that might be an example of why some of those would need to be looked at again by the court. Okay. And then Judge Purdy, obviously this would depend on the circumstances, but let's say a party is asking for total dissolution of a TRO or a TI what do you want to hear from a lawyer arguing for 100% total dissolution? And would you rather see somebody ask for a slight modification here or there as opposed to totally doing away with a TRO or TI? I've seen lawyers come in because they didn't get notice. And the statute speaks to upon three days of the issuance of a TRO without notice, you may file a motion to have it dissolved. And so we're gonna have a hearing about this notice issue. And that goes back to that scenario that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Hey, I've been in litigation with them for two years. They knew I represented this person. We talked that day. There was no reason for them to come down to get this TRO without our knowledge. I have totally dissolved the TRO on that basis alone because I'm not gonna play this notice game. 
Um, so I think if someone is not getting notice, and they can come in here within three days and persuade me that they did not get notice under the most egregious type of circumstances, that is a basis for dissolving. Um, modification, it just depends. But I, I just, I take that notice provision um, very seriously. Okay, and uh, as we're running out of time, I'm just running through the uh, questions that our attendees have posed. Uh, Judge, you did kind of speak about the foreclosure and eviction context earlier and what that might look like in seeking injunctive relief. Um, so I think that question hopefully is answered. And then one other question, assuming attorney's fees are recoverable in the underlying claim, have you ever successfully obtained or awarded fees immediately in the TI stage instead of after complete resolution on the merits? Uh, I, if that question is posed to me, I haven't done it because that, that injunction is just there until we get to a trial on the merits. Uh, so I've not seen the context in which I've done that before. I'll let anybody else on the panel speak in this final uh, moments that we have. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate because it is ultimate relief and that's not the point of an injunction as we've been saying. Josh, you may want to remind everyone about the number for the CLE. Sure. The okay, yeah, well, I... I Appreciate everybody for showing up here today. I hope this was a useful, informative, and entertaining uh, presentation. Uh, please remember to check the chat where Sherry has posted the CLE number to get your one hour of CLE credit. And uh, once again, uh, my thanks to Marcus, Ryan, Nicole, and Judge Purdy for your time today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you all.